Hi everyone, I'm Jessica with that hashtag show, and today we're here to talk about the new horror film Out of Darkness. I'm here with the director, Andrew Cumming, and two of the stars, Kit Young and Sophia Oakley Green. Thank you all for talking with me today. Now, Andrew, I want to start with you. Let's take it back to the very first idea for this film. Why Paleolithic horror specifically? Because that is a very, very specific kind of horror to do. Yeah, it's, it's niche, isn't it? Um, yeah, I I didn't know either, to be honest. I didn't. It wasn't like, you know, I had this idea for 20 years and I was waiting. I, I uh, watched a... I watched a BBC documentary about early modern humans and just found that time period really fascinating um, and felt it had been sort of underused in cinema for whatever reason. Turns out that reason is because it's really difficult. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you have to be naive in the beginning and just think that everything's fun and exciting. Um, being jaded comes later. And, um, and then, yeah, and then I read uh, William Golding's novel, The Inheritors, um, which is the book he wrote after The Lord of the Flies, um, and set in the same time period and is just a brilliant study of um, inhumanity and violence and 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 he does a great job of world building and I just I thought aha one day I'm going to make that book I'm going to adapt it the day you know I'll make loads of studio movies and make loads of money and some studio guy will say so what do you want to do now and I'll say well I'll do this um, <laughs> it'll be my little passion project and then I met Oliver Kassman the producer of the film and I told him this and he said, like, well, why don't you make that your debut? Because I've got this idea for a Paleolithic horror thing. And I was like, oh, yes, Paleolithic plus horror just felt like a way in to tell a really brutal, violent sort of origin story for our species. But with the tropes and the structure that horror provides um, to give it like a recognisable template. So that felt like we were onto something. And then Ruth Greenberg, the writer, she... She agreed. Um, she she didn't dismiss us as idiots and um, and came on the journey with us. And um, and yeah, and that was us. We were off to the races. Now you you mentioned there were some unique challenges to setting things in this time period, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I would guess one of those is the fact that this movie is in the cast are terrible. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> How rude! Right in front of them. No, we know it. We know it's true. We're, we're... going to tell the others too. We'll tell Sorry, yes, guys. So I saw an open goal and I took it. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. The um, the whole movie is in a fictional language, um, which is wild to me. So how did you <laughs> come up with the language and create that? Why was creating a language important for your vision for the film? Um, well, I'll say I didn't create it. Um, I wish I was that intelligent. Uh, no, I, 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 we found a guy. We knew a guy, um, Dr. Daniel Anderson, academic, multilinguist. Oliver knew him. The producer of the movie knew him. Um, so we set him the challenge, and he disappeared for four weeks and came back with this kind of Sanskrit, Arabic, Basque hybrid. And I read it sitting where I am now, out loud, and it, it worked. It felt like a real. Um, a real language and the reason for it is because on the one hand it gives the film an authenticity and a, a verisimilitude that I think otherwise it could have potentially been quite silly and secondly I had an inkling knowing some actors and knowing how actors would ideally like to be as divorced from themselves as possible I felt like maybe it could be a way you know it's just a way to create another level of realism for them um, and they can obviously speak to that much better than me, but I, I, I'm glad we made that choice because these guys committed to it fully, so. Absolutely. On the performance side, what's it like acting in a fictional language? Kit, I know you've done a little bit with fantasy languages before and like Shadow and Bone and stuff, but this is different, obviously, because it's throughout the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, okay, yeah. Talk Shadow and Bone for a sec. When it came to fictional languages, I got off easy because my character is the guy that goes, when someone goes, no, no, it's pronounced this way, I go, yeah, but my character wouldn't know that. Yeah. He wouldn't know that. So I'm just going to say it my way. Whereas with this, I was like, no, 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 I have to be fluent in something because I'm one of the original people on the planet. <laughs> um, so that, that that kind of a slightly kind of puts you in the deep end. We, I'm also stunned to hear actually, Andrew, that, that, um, that Daniel basically did it in four weeks. I didn't realize yeah, it was that know, quick. It was but obviously, but obviously he, he is just that smart. But yes. um we didn't really have that long. Um what helps is that 
other than Arno, none of us really have great speeches to do. There aren't there aren't huge Shakespearean monologues in Tola, Tola being the name of the language. Um, and so we were like, you know, you're you're able to kind of do it piece by piece. Um, but also we, we like the best thing was being able to kind of lean on each other and kind of go, okay, well, this is your bit. So you lead the charge, I'll follow you. And then kind of everybody kind of takes the baton at different times. Um, there were definitely moments where it was kind of like, well, you're the character in charge here, so you do it. <laughs> and then me kind of going, I'll also just be here. And then kind of ha- finding that that was Monday and on Tuesday, people probably expected me to lead the charge. So we all kind of had to, we, we it was all kind of give and take, but it's also just a lot of fun because I think inherently as actors, we're all kind of trying to work out the puzzle and trying to kind of put the pieces together and play our bit within the puzzle. So I didn't, even though I didn't have to say everything, I wanted to know what it sounded like and I wanted to know what it meant. And also you need to know what the other actors are saying. You don't want to be trapped in a scene where you go, well, I know my words, but what are you talking about? Yeah, you don't want to be trapped in that space. So so it, although we did have the English next to it, so we knew what we were saying, it when someone speaks it, that's a whole other level. And so yeah, it was definitely it was definitely a it was a it was a, it was kind of putting a jigsaw together, I'd say. That's true. Yeah. And Sophia, this was one of your first major roles, I believe, right? And they threw you in the deep end and said, now you have a new language to learn and everything. Mm-hmm. Before this, I had done two short films. So it really was like as deep in the deep end as you can deep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I felt like Bayer, Bayer, I think even in my audition scenes, I think two of the three I didn't even speak in. Like she just doesn't say a whole lot in the movie. And like with what Kit said, it was so important to know what everybody else was saying in the scene so that you knew what was going on. Because there's a lot of scenes where she's not like, she, there's a lot of like coverage of what she's thinking, but essentially they could be saying anything. So it was a lot of learning mm. what was happening in the scenes, learning that intention. And it was really freeing in a way because it's like, rather than thinking about, you know, the words and what 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 word was most important in a sentence or all of those things, you could just like look into the other person's eyes and like really see like, if their muscles sort of twitched or if something happened to their face, it meant you were just constantly there because the only kind of communication you had that you understood was their facial expressions. And the words mm. that came out were were something to surround that. But really it was it was the connection to people's faces. So I think it yeah. wasn't um it wasn't that hard. But I did find after finishing it and going on to other jobs where I had to speak in English, I was a bit scared. <laughs> I was like, oh, don't know if I can do this. And like now I'm like totally fine. But I think really having the opportunity to get immersed in something where you don't have to speak and where what you say it is important, but it's not, nobody knows what it is, was was a, an incredible experience and a real privilege. Yeah, really flexible. I also just, I'll just, I'll also just quickly add, it was much easier once certain characters started dying off because you're like, you know, well, if, six of a, if, if six of us are talking at once, this is a nightmare. I have no yeah. idea what you're saying, especially if yeah. you're pronouncing it different from that person. But then later on, there were definitely some moments where it was just the two of us where I was like, Oh, okay, just one person to worry about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh wait. Oh, and the director. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. only constant. Yeah. <laughs> Rightfully so, really. Andrew, how did you go about recreating this setting from forty thousand years ago? We've talked a little bit about the language, but there's also just the the costuming and the setting and the areas, all so very specific. Yeah, I mean, you 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 do a lot of research, you know, whether it was visiting museums or reading books. We also were very lucky to have um, Rob Dennis, one of the foremost experts in early modern humans in the UK, um, come on board as a as a, a supervisor, and we could just run things by him, and we picked his brains remorse, remorselessly, um, just and he would point us to various dig sites in Russia, Europe. They look at this here, they dug this up there, this tells us such and such about their, you know, their moving, the, their eating patterns or etc. We've, I say we, we, not us, but we've, as a species, have dug up, um, you know, researchers and archaeologists have dug up um, sewing needles made of bone. 
Um, so we understand there was tailoring going on and costuming, etc. So this what these people. What I wanted to do was get away from either Raquel Welsh in a fur bikini or this idea, this sort of Captain Caveman kind of ooga booga mm -hmm. thing, um, which is just are both very reductive. We were much smarter than that, much more sophisticated in terms of our culture and expression, etc. So then, yeah, it was just, you know, you do the research, you pack it in the trunk of your car, but you've still got to, you know, drive on the road and figure out where you're going. So it was very much a case of saying, do the research, but don't be beholden to it. We're not making a documentary. We're not making a Discovery Channel reenactment. This is still a movie. And Rob Dennis was really great with us because there are some paleontologists that, who believe if we didn't dig it up, we can't prove it. Whereas Rob, Rob's whole credo was, if we can do it, they could do it. They just did it differently to us. Like they, they, they can straighten ivory into a spear and we don't know how they did it. So these people were sophisticated. They talked to each other. You know, they, they, they expressed themselves through clothing, through hair, through, you know, just, of course you would, because we still do it to this day. I can't believe they were all just sitting around wondering when dinner was going to be served. You know, it just doesn't work. So yeah, that was it. It was just encouraging all the HODs to do the research and then, you know, start to imagine and start to blue sky based on what they'd amassed. And production designer, Jamie Latsley did a fantastic job of realizing that. Neve Morrison's um, hair and makeup um, really added an extra level of expression. Cause I think a lot of people expect just shaggy hair and um, you know, yeah. But it was just nice to sort of see, yeah, people that, you know, thought about their appearance. And 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 also you need to give the characters different looks just so everybody stands mm. out. So, yeah, um, it was, yeah, a team effort. And Michael O'Connor, Oscar winning costume designer, Michael O'Connor, um, I gave him a book by um, Richard Harrington called The Inuit, oh, press. Life As It Was. Look at yeah, and it's just his one of, I made earlier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's just full of um, just great images of this this amazing people who you know they hunt animals and use every part of the animal to sustain themselves and clothe themselves. And um, so he took a he took that as a jumping off point in terms of the look of these people. And yeah, it's um, so you know it's yeah it's part historic reenactment, but it's also part sci fi. That was the kind of thing I was going for. Is is this set in the past or the future? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think, like you were saying, finding that connection and avoiding a sort of stereotype really helps everybody now get involved in the story and, you know, feel scared by the horror and everything that's happening in the film. That's it. You, you, you're you trying to get rid of that barrier that exists in a museum where there's, there's a glass cabinet and there are the waxworks and we can look at them and sort of observe them. Whereas what you want in a movie, especially something as visceral as a horror movie, is oh my God, I'm part of the tribe and I'm at that fire and oh my God, what's that moving? What was that noise? Oh, why is he being weird? You know, all of these things together bring you into the movie. So you're not sitting back and going, God, they're so like us. You're brought in and you're saying, I'm so like them. And mm -hmm. that's the distinction that we tried to make at every point through, you know, every creative decision we made was to serve that. Absolutely. All right, last question for everybody. Why do you think people should go watch Out of Darkness? Quick, first thing you think of. First thing you think of. Don't overthink I it. I mean, for for me, very quickly, because <laughs> what else are you watching that's like it? Mm-hmm. Go. Go check it out. You ain't you ain't seen this before. Go check mm -hmm. it out. Why not? Very yeah. fair. You'll probably have a great time. Um, because uh, yeah, it you, there's nothing like it. It is cool. It is powerful it is empowering it's grisly it's it's real and it's also fun you know like it's like as real as it gets whilst also being not ridiculous but you know like you can go both ways with it so that's quite nice mm. yeah it's true. <laughs> yeah i'd echo both of those things and just say that it's uh it's it's a friday night movie but it's um but we tried to make something that was more than some of its parts. You know, it's exciting, it's thrilling, it's wonderfully performed, it's shot incredibly well. It's just a really visceral survival action horror thriller movie. And um, yeah, it's um, it, it hits it hits deep. 
and it hits deep. There you go. Sounds like a good pitch to me. All right. Everybody Out of Darkness is going to hit theaters February 9th. I hope you all go check it out.